Hey, thanks for joining us for Pact. I'm the P, Peter Coffin, the lovely Miss Astronaut Cowboy Doctor. Here is the ACD. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast service. Also, leave us a glowing review on Audible and Apple Podcasts. The reviews people have been leaving there have been very good. We thank you very much for that. If you haven't, now's the time. I'm a five-star man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, we need to work that shit into, into this. I can't believe we haven't already. Help us keep the lights on by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash pactpod. That's P-A-C-D-P-O-D. Your monthly support gets you into the Discord server, gets you exclusive content, and you see some content before everyone else. We've also got fantastic Pact merch available as well. Finally, tell your friends uh, we rely so big on word of mouth. We stream 7 p.m. Eastern on Saturdays. Thank you very much for tuning in. So, should we love America or should we hate America? It's important to know whether or not you are to look out upon the American proletariat and say, wow, you're the same goddamn thing as the U.S. state. I've seen this argument play out a few times. It's not necessarily a new one. However, the current iteration happened when Jackson Hinkle, who is a, a, a very, let's say, well-researched person who spent time debunking um the the syrian bullshit yeah and then like a few days ago it came out to be like bullshit or yeah whatever. the bbc <laughs> yeah. the bbc had to cave on it in all in all seriousness like he doesn't go out and just say shit so jackson hinkle tweeted i'm a marxist leninist i'm an anti-imperialist and then he rounded it out by saying i'm an american patriot <laughs> Yes, everybody turned into Darth Vader at the end of Revenge of the Sith. <laughs> this made Twitter mad. As, you know, saying basically anything where that could make Marxism, Leninism uh, appear vaguely relatable to a normal person tends to. Here's like a, a really critical concern that like, gives away the game for people who think that they're advocating for the most marginalized of the American populace. People assume that when you say, like, you're trying to appeal to a normal person, for some reason they think that normal person just means white people, and that, like, there aren't people of color who are patriotic. Uh, I, I don't know if we have to bring out the voting statistics but most people of color and most everyone in the united states are not people who hold settlers real tight and just put it up their butt that's not most people of color in the united states i was actually going to say settlers makes the argument that uh, white people in america are actually the labor aristocracy and not the proletariat like the real proletariat in America is people of color, which, uh, no. Like Franz Fanon, who wrote Black Skin, White Masks, for instance, has said that Appalachia was an oppressed nation. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get into like our arguments, we do want to run over some of the actual response to Jackson Hinkle's tweet. Yeah. Probably one of the biggest ones was this picture of Batman slapping Robin where Robin is saying, I'm a Marxist-Leninist, I'm an anti-imperialist, I'm an American patriot. Batman slaps him and says, that is social chauvinism. You're an opportunist. Lenin hates you. First off, Lenin did write at length about social chauvinism. What social chauvinism is, is when you support the bourgeois state of your nation over the international proletariat, which, to be clear, Jackson Hinkle is not arguing for, and neither are we. In fact, we're making a hard distinction between the American people and the U.S. state, which is the prime exerciser of U.S. imperialism. We want to differentiate between nationalism and patriotism, yeah. though. Not Those nationalism. This is not thing. a nationalism You thing. don't have to pay lip service to nationalism. Nationalism of the U.S. is not good in any way because we are the imperial core nationalism for oppressed nations and colonies is a totally different thing but for the united states that is something that i think criticism is 
Absolutely. Definitely necessitated. And and opponents of what Jackson Hinkle said are so insistent on making it that he's a social chauvinist or that he's pro-imperial core or that he's pro-U.S. state when, like, th- this is something that anybody supporting Jackson Hinkle's argument reiterates over and over. And it, I just, I don't know exactly what to make of that. Why are the opponents insistent on conflating that with nationalism or racism or white supremacy or whatever? And and one reasonable thing that I might be able to think of, people of color or people with indigenous roots might think of that. And it, it's like, at first, like maybe their visceral reaction is going to be like, Ugh, and they're going to like think about the history of the state automatically but how that's remediated as you say oh well the u.s state and its history are different than the american people i can support the american people and then it's over and and then it's just like why are people more interested in moralizing and bad faith framing of people who have the same goals ostensibly Ostensibly, that you have like why would you be more focused on making that person look like shit when they're one of the few communists who are like advocating for your material interest. I don't understand that. I'll tell you exactly what it is. Go. The rally to restore sanity. John Stewart and Colbert's oh, rally. Yeah. This is where so many of the communists of today come from. They grow out of the Obama liberalism and a discontent with where it went. They still see American patriotism as Oh my God, freedom fries. Oh my God, Muslims are bad. Like Right, right, right. I, I think that it, it is very important to listen to a diversity of backgrounds and their opinions on patriotism. Uh, I do think that when people ask questions like, what do black people think about this? One, it monoliths groups of marginalized population in a way that is fetishy and gross. Um, And two, it sent their standpoint theory in a way that um, I think is not relevant to a scientific socialist project. I realize that our scientific observations are informed by our experiences, but I don't use anecdotal experience to inform my criticism on structural problems. Or, or communist projects. Um, and nobody else should either. Agreed. I want to go ahead and say that arguments against scientific socialism that say, but that dismisses the struggles of native and indigenous people. That is a, a soft, noble, savage trope. This is the reason why I say that. I do not like seeing people say, oh, well, the natives don't believe in science, basically. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but no. Saying like native people don't believe in science is racist. Native people also believe in history and do analysis of conditions. They may not have called it that centuries ago, but the fact is people learn and develop. Things progress. And to to, to fetishize like Native people as not doing that, as like returning to monkey, that is, I think that is ultimately fetishizing a noble savage trope. And I don't like that. The struggle is different for indigenous peoples in the same way that the struggle towards a socialist project is different for any given society based off of their historical conditions and the relationship of that people to those historical conditions. There isn't some inherent, you know, biologically baked in difference. There there are historical differences in how the struggle of indigenous people and how the struggle of I guess settler proles. There, there are differences based off of their historical relationships to their environment, and that's what scientific socialism is. Yeah, so, and that's why there will be a socialism with American characteristics that, as opposed to right. That that struggle is different. The struggle of settler proles is not incompatible, but it's a different relationship to the historical conditions of their time and how they've moved dialectically up to this point where they evolved. That's how it's different in China. That's how it's different or was different in the USSR. That's how it was different and is different in different areas of Africa. Like 
Yes, of course, the struggle is different because they have different relationships and they have different historical conditions and different relationships to them based off of the evolution of their history. That's not controversial. Anyway, here's a couple of more reactions. Um, This is from our favorite Zoe Baker. Socialism will be based on internationalism and oppose patriotism or it will not be socialist at all. As a group of Belgian workers wrote in 1836, there is no other fatherland but the world. Or as Italian anarchist Pietro Gori sung, the whole world is our country. I love that shit. The whole world is our country as it implies that we can be a communist globe tomorrow. The the patriotism of nations bringing forth socialist projects are part of the internationalist project. Absolutely. Patriotism isn't being opposed to other lands. Like, it's people who can't think dialectically. Some more reactions. Socialism with American patriot characteristics, which is a phrase that no person alive has said. Yeah. (laughs) Socialism with American patriot characteristics is just the Nordic model where racism is still rampant. But hey, free health care. That one's particularly funny because that's somebody that doesn't understand that like socialism is completely because of the international proletariat and its interest opposed to the Nordic model entirely. Yeah. Show me a, a Marxist Leninist that's like all about like, the Nordic yeah, model. Fuck yeah, Denmark. <laughs> yeah. You're not <laughs> the the first thing that a Marxist Leninist will say in praising the welfare systems of like northern western Europe is Yes, this might be good for the people in the meantime in those particular countries, but it is on the backbone of the international proletariat and the global south and indigenous people who are colonized. Yes, exactly. We don't support that. That's not an end goal to a project. Um, Some more reactions. What purpose does orienting our communism around being proud to be part of the United States serve? Which is, again, not what anyone is advocating for yeah being an american patriot does not necessitate love for the state in fact i think that it necessitates the opposite if you love the american working class you hate the historical legacy of the state and what the state is continuously doing and even not only black and indigenous comrades the the white workers as well Mm -hmm. Uh, if you love America and you're an American patriot, you should have the utmost disdain for the state because of its history um, and because of its its current operation. If you say you love America, that means you love the American empire and its imperialist history. They are completely, absolutely inseparable. That's, that's the most blatantly incorrect one and goes back to what I was saying about how if you love the American people, you by necessity have to hate everything that the American state has done. Essentially everything. A collective support for your fellow person living in your land. There is nothing wrong with that. And there is something facilitatory about that. There there is something that underpins a movement to that. In contribution to other patriotic movements that combined comprise the international proletariat supporting one another. What is so fucking bad about that? And how can people not separate that from the actions of a capitalist bourgeois state? Of course, fucking communists don't support that. So let's maybe start with Mao. Okay. What Mao has to say about patriotism and internationalism. Okay, go for it. Can a communist who is an internationalist at the same time be a patriot? We hold that he not only can be, but must be. The specific content of patriotism is determined by historical conditions. There is the patriotism of the Japanese aggressors and of Hitler, and there is our patriotism. Communists must resolutely oppose the patriotism of the Japanese aggressors and of Hitler. The communists of Japan and Germany are defeatists with regard to the wars being waged by their countries. To bring about the defeat of the Japanese aggressors and of Hitler by every possible means is in the interests of the Japanese and the German people. And the more complete the defeat, the better. For the wars launched by the Japanese aggressors and Hitler are harming the people at home as well as the people of the world. China's case, however, is different because she is the victim of aggression. 
Chinese communists must therefore combine patriotism with internationalism. We are at once internationalists and patriots, and our slogan is, fight to defend the motherland against the aggressors. For us, defeatism is a crime, and to strive for victory in the war of resistance is an inescapable duty. For those fighting in defense of the motherland, can we defeat the aggressors and achieve national liberation? And only by achieving national liberation will it be possible for the proletariat and other working people to achieve their own emancipation. The victory of China and the defeat of the invading imperialists will help the people of other countries. Thus, in wars of national liberation, patriotism is applied internationalism. So this is good because even in the beginning, when talking about the patriotism of Germany and Japan, condemning that immediately, Mao separates the Japanese and German people from that patriotism. Exactly. And talks about how patriotism in China, which is the victim of these oppressor imperialist nations, benefits the people of those countries, of those imperialist countries. Uh, talking about Chinese patriotism in this case. He doesn't talk about it so much and like talking about the patriotism of the Japanese and German people. Um, but he does differentiate between the patriotism of the state and the interests of the peoples of those states. The defeat of the Japanese and German states by every possible means is in the interests of the Japanese and German people. And if you are to care about those people, you are against those states. Right. Like bourgeois versus proletarian and patriotism being different things. Well, let's talk about abolish the family. It's not saying abolish all familial connection. It is saying there's a specific bourgeois mode of family which is enforced upon the proletariat. And the proletariat family has actually been eroded by this. They want to take that on. That is not, the perfect fucking metaphor for this. I appreciate that. It's, it's not, you know, abolition of patriotism, which is something that can be beneficial and helpful. It's abolition of state patriotism and the way that the bourgeoisie has enforced patriotism to be wrapped up in service of the state, yeah. it, it, which includes, you know, capitalism, racialized hierarchy, etc. Patriotism of the people resists that and needs to resist that, just like um, adoption of whatever familial motive is beneficial for you as a proletarian family is good. Ultimately, familial relations aren't intended to just go away. The, the point of abolish the family, which I don't think is a good slogan by any means because people don't understand it. Abolish the bourgeois family obviously didn't catch fire, though. Yeah. <laughs> but that being said, um, the idea is simply to end the bourgeois economic coercion that enforces a specific mode of family, where whatever mode you end up doing, whether it's communal, whether it's polyamory, whether it's whatever. I mean, none of these things are the revolution, but the result of removing the economic coercion gives you the ability to self-actualize in any of these different situations and develop community on your own terms. The idea is to not dictate what it looks like. To, again, go back to socialism, utopian, and scientific, to put forward a specific family uh, it is, is to abstract uh, away from reality. Right. Right. Exactly. Same with patriotism. That's beneficial to the proletariat. Another Mao quote, as for people who are politically backward, communists should not slight or despise them, but should befriend them, unite with them, convince them and encourage them to go forward. So this is even if someone's patriotism sucks, you can unite with them and, and rechannel that into something that's beneficial for everyone with marginalized peoples of your country at the forefront. I really want to just lightly touch on the Browderism. So uh, some people have said that's Browderism, which is incorrect. It's not Browderism. Browder was somebody who caused a bunch of rifts in the Communist Party. William Z. Foster was ultimately uh, Browder's enemy in the CPUSA. Anyway, Mao, the guy who we just quoted on patriotism, uh, you know, Mao. <laughs> yeah, Mao, that guy. I'm going to read uh, notes that are appended to this telegram first. Earl Browder was the general secretary of the Communist Party of the United States of America from 1930 to 1944. 
during World War II, the rightist ideas in the Communist Party of the USA, of which Browder was the chief exponent, developed into an anti-Marxist revisionist capitulation line. From December 1943 onward, Browder advocated this line in a number of speeches and articles, and in April 1944, he published Tahiran as his right opportunist program. Revising the basic Leninist thesis that imperialism is monopolistic, decadent, and moribund capitalism, and denying the imperialist nature of U.S. capitalism, he declared that U.S. capitalism retains some of the characteristics of a young capitalism, and that there's a common interest between the proletariat and the big bourgeoisie of the USA. Thus, he pled for the safeguarding of the system of monopolist trusts and dreamed about saving U.S. capitalism from inevitable crisis by means of class conciliation. Basing himself on this absurd appraisal of U.S. capitalism and following a capitulationist line of class collaboration with monopoly capital, Browder in May of 1944 presided over the dissolution of the Communist Party of the USA the party of the U.S. proletariat, and formed a non-party organization, the Communist Political Association of the USA. From the very beginning, Browder's wrong line met with opposition from many members of the Communist Party in the USA, with Comrade William Z. Foster at their head. Under the leadership of Comrade Foster, the Communist Political Association in June 1945 passed a resolution denouncing Browder's line. In July, the association held a special national convention and decided on the thorough liquidation of this line and reestablishment of the Communist Party USA. Browder was expelled from the party in February of 1946 because he persisted on this stand, which was a betrayal of the proletariat, because he openly supported the imperialist policy of the Truman administration and engaged in factional activities against the party. So anyway, Mao sent a telegram to William Z. Foster. I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're glad to learn that the special convention of the Communist Political Association of the United States has resolved to repudiate Browder's revisionist, that is, capitulous line, and has reestablished Marxist leadership and revived the Communist Party of the United States. We hereby extend to you our warm congratulations on this great victory of the working class and the Marxist movement in the United States. Browder's whole revisionist, capitulationist line, which is fully expressed in his book, in essence reflects the influence of reactionary U.S. capitalist groups on the U.S. workers' movement. Same guy who was like, our patriotism is internationalism, perfectly capable of drawing the distinction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. So there's a reason why William C. Foster wrote the book on Marxism, Leninism versus Revisionism, and was also arguing for what was ultimately what we would call today socialism with American characteristics. Uh, his book, by the way, is called Towards a Soviet America, if you're interested in that. He also criticizes state-instituted patriotism in that text as well, but that's very much not what we're talking about. And if you recall, there were Twitter people saying, socialism with American characteristics is just the Nordic model. <laughs> Which, again, is the opposite it's, it's of so Marxist stupid. It's so fucking stupid. There will be no such thing as a socialism that starts in any place that does not take on characteristics of the society it springs forward from because the conditions in that society will force it to. You cannot escape the fact that the conditions of the society that exists prior is what socialism springs forward from. You cannot escape that. If indeed there is still a United States as we develop socialism, that will be socialism with American characteristics. It will not spring forward from idealism. They all think that socialism is something that you can vote into existence or convince people um, to manifest it in their vision boards or what the fuck ever. It does. And scientific. So there's a reason why it matters that William Z. Foster not only wrote towards the Soviet America, but was the top billing on Marxism-Leninism versus re revisionism. There's a specific reason why this is relevant to this. And it is a an essay that Lenin wrote called On the National Pride of the Great Russians. Now, we're not going to read this thing in its entirety, but there are a few selections from this that are extremely relevant to what we're talking about. Is a sense of national pride alien to us, great Russian class-conscious proletarians? Certainly not. We love our language and our country, and we are doing our very utmost to raise her toiling masses, which, by the way, I want to, I want to quickly emphasize that he is 
uh, italicizing her because he wants to stand in, in stark contrast to people using the phrase fatherland because this bitch will not give up. He's going serious girl boss in terms of Mother Russia. He is. Uh, we are doing our very utmost to raise her toiling masses, i.e. nine-tenths of her population, to a level of democratic and socialist consciousness. To us, it is most painful to see and feel the outrages, the oppression and the humiliation our fair country suffers at the hands of the czars, butchers, the noblists, and the capitalists. We take pride in the resistance to these outrages put up from our midst, from the great Russians, in that midst having produced Radischev, the Decembrists, and the revolutionary commoners of the 70s. In the great Russian working class having created in 1905 a mighty revolutionary party of the masses, and in the great Russian peasantry having begun to turn towards democracy and set about overthrowing the clergy and the landed proprietors. He's advocating for a sense of pride in Russia's people and how that's an integral force of proletarian revolution. Absolutely. And there is an implication that in order to be patriotic, one has to reject the state mm -hmm. in this paragraph. Mm -hmm. He goes further into that in the next selection. However, it's important to understand the germ of that is here. We are full of a sense of national pride, and for that very reason, we particularly hate our slavish past. When the land nobility led the peasants into war to stifle the freedom of Hungary, Poland, Persia, and China, and our slavish present, when these self-same landed proprietors, aided by the capitalists, are loading us into a war in order to throttle Poland and the Ukraine, crush the democratic movement in Persia and China, and strengthen the game of Romanovs, Babrinskis, and Prishkevskis who are a disgrace to our great Russian national dignity. Nobody is to be blamed for being born a slave, but a slave who not only eschews a striving for freedom, but justifies and eulogizes his slavery, for example, calls the throttling of Poland and the Ukraine, etc., a defense of the fatherland of the great Russians. Such a slave is a lick spittle and a boor who arouses a legitimate feeling of indignation, contempt, and loathing. No nation can be free, if it oppresses other nations, said Marx and Engels, the greatest representatives of consistent 19th century democracy, who became the teachers of the revolutionary proletariat, and, full of a sense of national pride, we great Russian workers want, come what may, a free and independent, a democratic, republican, and proud great Russia, one that will base its relations with its neighbors on the human principle of equality, and not the feudalist principle of privilege which is so degrading to a great nation. Just because we want that, we say, it is impossible in the 20th century and in Europe, even in the far east of Europe, to defend the fatherland otherwise than by using every revolutionary means to combat the monarchy, the landowners and the capitalists of one's own fatherland, that is, the worst enemies of our country. We say that the great Russians cannot defend the fatherland otherwise than by desiring the defeat of Tsarism in any war, this as the lesser evil to nine-tenths of the inhabitants of Great Russia. For Tsarism not only oppresses those nine-tenths economically and politically, but also demoralizes, degrades, dishonors, and prostitutes them by teaching them to oppress other nations and to cover up this shame with hypocritical and quasi-patriotic phrases. He goes so far as to say that support of the prior state, of the bourgeois state, or even specific to Tsarist regimes, is... Quasi-patriotic. Yeah. And that real patriotism is opposition towards this and binding together as a Russian people to oppose the Tsar. And this past historical legacy of what he's talking about, feudalism and the, pr the principle of privilege that dictates feudal policies. The ruling class, though. Right. So ultimately, if you apply this to the United States of America today, what is that? It's quasi-patriotic to support the U.S. state, but to support the vast majority of people in America of any background, that is pride in America. That is what we are advocating for. We are not advocating against internationalism. We're not advocating against the international proletariat. We would at any time, just as Lenin said right here, support 
the international proletariat over our own bourgeois state. He is specifically saying it's not defending the fatherland to support the wars that the fatherland perpetuates in Eastern Europe against, say, what was Poland, it? Poland, the Ukraine, Poland, Persia. Ukraine, Persia, etc. That is not patriotic in Lenin's eyes. Lenin views um, using the rhetoric of uh, the czar and the fatherland there as quasi patriotism. But here's here's the biggest problem with it, and this is why uh, I specifically included that that Zoe Baker tweet. To imply that there will be no socialism with American characteristics or socialism with any country that exists currently characteristics is ultimately to deny the lower stages of communism. Right. Exactly. Because there will not be a world revolution that occurs at, at, at once. That's well, not in going to happen. There will be, in her mind, there will be. She has a PhD in anarchism. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they'll tweet about a general strike enough, and then everyone in the world will do it. For one day, and that'll be the end of capitalism. Well, and it so gives away the game, too, with Zoe Baker doing that quote. Yeah. The Gori quote, because it's like... The whole world is our country. Yeah. Which means that, like, you think that that has some kind of material relevance, which, if that were the case, we wouldn't... We would be in communism already. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and we could just, like, push the communism button. Oh, there's your problem. You had the society switch set to capitalist. Oh, wait, shit. Fuck, we forgot. The whole world is our country. Now I mean, we can do communism. That's pure what idealism. It's pure God idealism. God, pure idealism. So mad. The one thing that I kind of want to double down on a little bit, I, I do think it's very strange that the response to this Jackson Hinkle tweet, somebody who like makes content that's very explicitly communist and supportive of the international proletariat, uh, direct Marxist Leninist ideas being put forward. Also um, got himself in trouble over questioning the state line on the Syrian government. Yeah. The U S state line on it. Yeah. And, um, just very explicitly as a Marxist Leninist prioritizing the needs of the most marginalized of the working class in the United States at the forefront of an American proletarian revolution. I, I find it so strange that someone who is so explicitly that is immediately targeted by people who claim to want a stateless, classless society. Like they're more interested rather than like having a conversation with this person that is collaborative and working together and maybe seeing the merits of what they're saying, they're more interested than painting an outspoken communist as a bad person and, and, and thus further driving a wedge between communists in the spaces that are talking about this. And it's not only Twitter. This is a reflective, this is a, a microcosm of a larger problem in how a man, American communists discuss communist projects. And ultimately, it's not just a rejection of him saying, I'm a patriot. It's a rejection of the American people. And it's also saying, like, if you think this, you're racist, you're a white supremacist, you, you support the U.S. state, which is just fucking ridiculous, as we see in that Lenin quote, that those are opposite interests. It is a rejection of, ultimately, the American people. It's a rejection that they are somehow important in the overall pursuit of communism. My communism doesn't include the white proletariat. And like it's like, well, nobody said the white proletariat, bitch. Yeah. No one's talking about white people. No one has been. You're the one who said that. You're the one who assigned patriotism to white You're people. You're the one that assigns America to white people. Exactly. Do you think that people are going to think that you're supporting their interests if you say, hey, fuck America. Fuck you. Fuck your friends. Fuck your family. Fuck where you live. Do you think that people are going to be like... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, this person gets especially, it. Especially, <laughs> especially people who don't agree with you. Yeah. Like, like maybe somebody who is already in your esoteric, erudite, like anarchist collective, and they'll be like, "Yeah, most Americans aren't like that." Uh, from derived from any background, any socioeconomic stat. Well, 
any working class socioeconomic status, any race, any ethnicity, any sexual gender minority status, any disability status. Most people are not like that outside of your little fucking Twitter group chat that quotes Pietro Gordi. Like, <laughs> There's a reason that the concentration of capital keeps promoting these viewpoints, which are not dangerous to capital at all. Yeah. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that it's beneficial to have communists thinking that it's good to faction themselves. And good to hate Americans. Well, yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying, is to, to take an unpopular position that is ineffective for enacting communist goals. That's wonderful. But there will absolutely be multiple stages of communism. What are they? Um, the first one, the first stage of communism, and, and remember, every time that we bring this forth, um, it's important to think about it historically and dialectically. Um, the first stage of communism is when I am having sex with your mom, and the second stage is when I am having sex with your dad. That's all for today. Thanks again for watching or listening. This is Pact. I'm Peter. This is Miss Astronaut Cowboy Doctor. To help us out, click like, follow, subscribe, whatever. Leave us five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Audible. To support us, become a patron at patreon.com slash pactpod. That's P-A-C-D-P-O-D. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time.